Thank you. Good afternoon. I see we still have the non-basketball fans. Huh? Did a few people leave to watch some basketball games? Well, thank you so much for allowing me to come and visit with you this afternoon. I realize that not very many of you may know much about me, uh, but I am so honored and thankful to be able to be with you today. Uh, I'm a farmer and rancher from South Dakota, and I thank you. I served in our legislature for just a few years, ran for Congress, and I served in Congress for eight years and then just recently ran for governor and was elected as the first governor of South Dakota. I enjoyed listening to President Trump speak earlier. I've heard him speak many times and I've visited with him. I worked with him extensively on policies while I served in Congress and I'll never forget one of the first times that I met with him uh, when he was in uh, his Oval Office. He invited me in. It was right after we had passed a health care reform bill through the House. And he said, Christy, come over here and sit down and let's visit and talk for a while on the couches. And I said, Mr. President, you need to come to South Dakota sometime. I said, we have Mount Rushmore. And he said, oh, did you know? It is my dream to have my face on Mount Rushmore. <laughs> and I did that. I laughed. He wasn't laughing. Not, he wasn't laughing at all. No, it was unbelievable. So I said, come, come. I'm sure we can make room. There's space. It's a big mountain. We can fit another face on there. But no, I love him. There is nobody that is more passionate about his job, more passionate about doing the right thing, and more passionate about being the greatest ally and the greatest president to love Israel that we've ever had in the United States. Now, it's no secret that we don't have a large Jewish population in South Dakota. We have three or four. No, wait, we have more than that. We have a few more than that. But we do have two synagogues. We have one rabbi. Uh, we recently, uh, in the last couple of years, had Rabbi Mendel Alperwitz move from the Bronx to South Dakota. Pretty much the same. I don't think there was any adjustment there from the Bronx to South Dakota, but I have so loved getting to know Rabbi Mendel and his family. They are so passionate about their faith, about educating all the population of South Dakota, about the Jewish people and the, what they cherish so dear, and it has just meant the world to me to have him as an advisor, a voice of wisdom and discernment. You know, I grew up in an evangelical household that from the time I was a little girl, I was told that we love Israel and we pray for Israel every day. My dad was a big cowboy, real strong big cowboy that worked all the time, and I would say, why? And he would say, because God told us to. And so that's what we did. But I wanted to talk a little bit about some firsts uh, before I realize you're behind schedule, so I'm going to talk fast. But being the first woman governor in South Dakota is pretty special to me. I didn't run on my gender. I didn't talk about it all during the campaign. I talked about my experience and my willingness to tackle big problems. And so when I won that election, we went immediately to work, talking about my business experience, it, applying it to running our state. And we have a very small state. I think that creates a unique opportunity for us. I expect South Dakota, because we're small, that we can do things that other states can't do. We can be more nimble. We can do things and reforms that the rest of the country can look at our state and say, look at what South Dakota is doing. We can accomplish that. We can be a testimony to the rest of the country about what really is possible. Now, we just finished our first legislative session. I was sworn into office in January, two days later, Later, our legislative session started, and it's already over. So that means we have a 40-day session, and then all the legislators go home. It is amazing. I love it. They're all citizen legislators. They all have other jobs. They come to town, balance their budget, and then they go home back to their regular jobs. I think every state could learn from that. But I ran on four pillars. I wasn't going to raise taxes. I wasn't going to grow government. I was going to continue to fight the federal government bureaucracy 
and transparency. We were going to be honest with the people in our state and tell them exactly how their dollars were being spent and how we were going to run our state that would be important for the next generation. Everything in my office is about the next generation. In fact, every bill that gets filed in our legislature, I have a bill analysis form that my staff goes through. The last line on that analysis form where they talk about what this bill does, what the impact will be on the economy, how it impacts small business owners across the state, the last line that my staff has to fill out is what does this do to the next generation? You see, I don't think that people my age should be making decisions for ourselves. We should be making decisions for our kids and our grandkids, and I want everyone on every piece of legislation that comes forward thinking about what this does to set us up for the future and give our children and grandchildren a better life. Now, I know one of the bills that came this year that I was so proud to sign into law was an intellectual diversity bill. It said that all of our universities in South Dakota will make sure that they are teaching intellectual diversity in all forms. All viewpoints will be heard. Now, this has been a, content, a contentious issue across the country. We've seen our universities stifle free speech, not allow uh, equal opportunity to share viewpoints. In fact, I remember one time not so many years ago, just about eight to nine years ago, I was sitting in one of our larger university debate halls where they were having a forum that I decided to drop in on that was titled as, Is the Constitution Relevant to Today's Student? I thought, well, that seems like a wonderful uh, forum to sit in on. I'll go in there and stop. They had five people up on the panel talking about, to 500 students, is this Constitution of the United States relevant to today's student? Did you know that not a single one of those debate presenters said that it was relevant to the students? Everyone argued that because those students hadn't had a chance to weigh in on the Constitution, to change it, to add their finger point, fingerprint to it, that it wasn't relevant to them. I was furious. So how thrilling for me, as the first female governor of South Dakota, to come home and have one of the first bills that I've signed to say that every college campus in our state will lead the nation by ensuring that there will be intellectual diversity on every single campus and every viewpoint will be heard. The second thing I want to touch on is that's a first for our country that just recently happened in South Dakota is that we have the Keystone XL pipeline that will be coming through our state. It's pretty important to the president, it's pretty important to this country and our energy security into the future. Now we all know what happened up in our sister state to the north of South Dakota. We don't say her name very often. Little competition between the Dakotas there. 